Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. We're ministering this week, traveling, uh, staying in hotels each night. Therefore, we are pre-recording all this week through Friday because we just never can be sure of the quality of the internet connection and we don't want the broadcast to be cut short because the bandwidth glitches or something. So uh, thanks for bearing with, with us. We absolutely miss you in the live chat box that comes in the dashboard for the live broadcast. But today we are studying in Matthew chapter 22. I love the Gospels because while you can read the pastoral epistles or the Pauline epistles, they tell us about Jesus. When you read the Gospels, you are receiving from the Master. You are drinking from Jesus' Spirit in a direct narrative from Jesus to you. It's not just the narrative about Jesus. It is the narrative of Jesus speaking right to our hearts. I know for many years as a young pastor, I spent a lot of time in the Pauline epistles and the pastoral epistles of Peter and James and John. But uh, there came that point that I spent years just absorbing. I heard uh, Larry Lee, uh, a pastor, many of you might not know his name, but a mega church pastor of years gone by back in the 80s, he said, uh, Read the red and pray for the power. In other words, focus just on the teachings of Jesus. I believe it's a real imbalance not to emphasize the teachings of Jesus even more so than the topical teaching that we get in studying the other epistles. I would say after the neglect of the Old Testament, uh, the Gospels are the next most neglected narratives in the canon of Scripture. And doing expositional Bible study like we do in our broadcast, we're seeking to correct that. So, again, we're studying in Matthew chapter 23 today. I might have said chapter 22 just a moment ago, but I meant chapter 23. Pray for me, as for the first time in a long time, I've been struggling with a bit of a head cold, and uh, so it, it takes a little more focus than what I uh, normally have to reach for when we do our studies. Matthew 23, does your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees? In chapter 23 of Matthew, Jesus condemns the outward show of the religious pride of the Pharisees and scribes of his day. Do we have Pharisees and scribes today? People more focused on outward expressions of faith than inward appropriation of the reality, the authenticity of their faith? I think this is a relevant chapter, don't you? Uh, the Pharisees, they looked good outwardly, but their private lives and their heart of hearts were deeply corrupt. Because of this, the culture of Judaism would ultimately reject Jesus and they would be scattered through the known world at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. A fate which, if you believe what Jesus says about it, could have been averted. And a sad example for us that Christianity, those of us that are part of Christian culture, should learn from lest we suffer the same fate, lest Christianity as we know it go the way of first century Judaism that didn't know the day of their visitation. The Lord asked me about the first two weeks that I was in full-time ministry, back I was 21, 22 years old, I was praying out in front of my house on 11th Street in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and the Lord stopped me short as I paced back and forth on my front porch praying. He said, is there any difference in character or tone between Christianity as you know it and the religious system of the first century that crucified Jesus? And I said, Lord, there's very little difference. 
He said, I am coming to restore my people to my purpose, but I am not coming to restore the prevailing religious system of Christianity as you understand it and perceive it to be. That was a very sobering thing. And if I ever heard God say one thing to me, I know that came straight from the throne. Let's begin reading in Matthew 23. It's 39 verses. Let's read verses 1 through 23. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do after their works, for they say and do not. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them upon men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers." But all of their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, the borders of their garment. They enlarge the borders of their garment. They love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. And greetings in the marketplace and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But, Jesus continues, be not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And all you are brothers. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you will neither go in yourselves, nor will you suffer those that are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Very powerful language. You look that word woe up, it means a curse on you. For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. In other words, you realize what he's saying? He's more interested in kindness to the marginalized than he is in your prayer life. Oh, my goodness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you turn him into twofold the child of hell that you, you yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. You fools and blind, whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. Whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever swear by the gift of upon it, he is guilty. You fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift, therefore Whosoever shall swear by the altar sweareth by it and all things thereon, and whosoever swear by the temple swears by it and all things therein. And he that swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him that sits thereon. And of course we know Jesus in another gospel said, Swear not at all, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. We do not have to have gradations of authenticity or validity of the things that we say. Let your word be your bond in essence. So in chapter 3 of Matthew, Jesus, now he's addressing the common people that are surrounding these people that are the multitude round about as he's contending with three groups of people, the scribes, the Pharisees, also don't forget the Herodians, the Sadducees in the previous several chapters. And he's, he's drawing attention to the multitude. He's pointing these guys out. Can you imagine your pastor pointing out someone in the church and saying, now you folks, you do what Brother Deacon over here tells you to do, but don't live your life like Brother Deacon lives his life. Do you see how inappropriate Jesus could be at times? What if, what if your pastor got up and singled out a whole row of leaders in the church saying, now you do what they tell you to, but don't do what they're actually doing. Don't follow the example of their lives. Jesus goes on to say that these sit in Moses' seat. They're known to be corrupt, but they sit in Moses' seat. And as such, please understand, Jesus is saying that not everything 
that they are teaching should be completely disregarded. But he makes a point, do not follow their personal examples. Is that wisdom for us today? Have you ever been, have you ever sat under a leader that had a good message, but over time things came to light and you realized that their personal example is not one you should follow? This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying they sit in Moses' seat and it's not necessary to disregard everything they say, but be instructed as Jesus instructed the people not to follow the personal example these authorities set because they said correct things, but their lives did not reflect the principles they espouse. So now we come to this issue of religious authority or spiritual authority. How are we to respond to leadership. If a leader fails, does that, does that just give us a pass to go live any way we want to? God ordains leadership, this is true, but Jesus in his teaching, he's making it clear that personal accountability does not dissolve simply because a leader fails us. People say, well, I've been church hurt, and they throw out all the mandates and the commands of Christ and go live any way they want to, and if you uh, call them to account for it, they say, well, I'm church hurt. You can't ask me to, to, to do any differently than what I'm doing. Is that correct thinking? Jesus is suggesting that's not the case. If you have a pastor that hurts your feelings, if you have someone who offended you, someone who wounded you deeply, that is no pass. That does not give you an exemption to say, well, I'm just church hurt. I'm just going to give up. I quit. And as though you have some le- legitimate basis upon which you can exempt yourself from the claims of Christ upon your life. Brother and sister, don't fall into that trap. Listen, we are not to take the failures of our leaders, such as the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Jesus' day, as an excuse to exempt ourselves from the mandates of God's word. And even the teachings of these corrupt leaders themselves, not everything they say, see, only insofar as what they teach actually reflects true teaching of the Word of God, we should be paying attention. It's like they say, and we've said it so much, it's lost its meaning, eat the meat, spit out the bones. So what is wrong? What is actually wrong with the leadership examples of the scribes and the Pharisees? Verses 4 and 5 tell us that their piety is an outward show only. They bind heavy burdens upon others, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So their piety is an outward show only, and their burdens of discipleship that they impose upon others, in reality, they aren't obeying themselves. How many times have you seen the preacher, and I've seen this, leaders in churches, oh, you come sit under my ministry, and when you're ready, I'll let you know. Yes, you come over, and you carry my briefcase, and you set up the sound system, and you work as an unpaid volunteer in my ministry, and when you're ready, I'll let you know. And 20 years later, oh, yes, uh, you come over and mow the church lawn, and you be a greeter, and, and work in the parking lot to get people parked, and when you're ready, I'll let you know. Well, did they do those things? They would say, you coming over and cutting my grass here at the church. That's the key to your ministry taking off. Is that, was that the key to how their ministry took off? Many times, that's not the case. See, here we see the difference between leaders after God's own heart and those leaders that we cannot benefit from. Listen to me. Teachers and ministers often lay out for you their ideas about what God requires as to how you can come into the place of blessing in your life. And those ideas many times uh, include uh, you benefiting them greatly, uh, but yet you never seem to come to the place where the payoff comes, the benediction comes. See, if you look at the example of the person who's teaching you, if you find that they did not come to blessing in the same way they're insisting that you conduct yourself, then you better start thinking twice. In 1 John chapter 1, the apostle commands that when we teach, John, the apostle John, in 1 John chapter 1, he said that we must teach what we have seen and heard. In other words, I, if I'm not speaking to you out of my experience, then that is a form of deception. I, I'm not allowed to give you my theories or my ideas 
that do not reflect my experience in God. To preach to others that which has not been walked out in my life is a form of deception, although it is a very common practice in Christian leadership. When a leader instructs you, take a look at what you can know about their lives. Have they walked in the path that they insist is incumbent upon you? If not, then you should consider very carefully whether you want to follow after that person's teaching. I've watched men and women. I've been mentored in the prophetic, and I would see those men and women would say, well, you must do this, Russ. You must take this path. You must do that. But I know something about them and realize that had nothing to do with how God brought, brought them along, how God raised them up. So I ignored what they were telling me to do, and I learned from the example of what actually worked in their life in terms of walking with God, and then they would have a problem with it. Oh, no, you can't do that. Why? Because they think they're different from everybody else. You really need to learn this, or you spend years of your life following after somebody's idea about what breakthrough looks like without ever reaching to breakthrough for yourself. Kitty and I are committed to never doing that to you. We will always speak to you out of what we've seen and out of what we heard. Then in verse 7, Jesus said that we should call no man rabbi or master. Now that word rabbi in other places is translated teacher, and it's really something to think about, because in Psalm 111.9, the psalmist said concerning God himself, he said, holy and reverend is his name. Is it wrong to think of someone as a spiritual father? Or to call even your natural progenitor father. I remember I was in uh, Christian International down in uh, Seagrove, Florida. And I love Christian International. Apostle Bill Hammond, he's really been a big blessing to me. But in my knowledge of Bill and getting to know him over the years, he was always Bill to me. Uh, because that was just the nature of my connection to Bishop Hammond. And I was in uh, their bookstore and sharing with one of the staff about some experiences I'd had with Bill and Bill Hammond, and he kept correcting me. Every time I'd say Bill, he'd say Bishop. And every time I'd say Bill, he'd say Bishop. And as though he was, oh, no, you can't call him Bill. You must call him Bishop. Well, even Paul the Apostle said, I'm an apostle to some, but I'm not an apostle to everybody. Bill Hammond, it has been a deep, tremendous, and powerful blessing in my life in years past, but he was not my bishop. Do you understand? We're talking about titles. We're talking about... Uh, leaders that demand a deference that has nothing to do with the impact that they've had upon your life. Bill had an impact. Bill Hammond has had an impact on my life. That's powerful and sweet and even life-changing, but it was not such as made him a bishop in my life. He might have been a bishop to that little staff member, but he wasn't that to me. And that didn't mean I was being disrespectful. So... Is it wrong to think of somebody as your spiritual father? Well, I don't think Jesus is saying that nobody can be your spiritual father. Uh, some people interpret it that way, but Paul himself spoke of being the father, the spiritual father of the Corinthian church, and he said, you, you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but you do not have many fathers, for he said, I've begotten you. He said this to the Corinthian church. He said, I've begotten you through the gospel. Now, the point is, balancing out Paul's statements with what Jesus taught, uh, no man, woman, or teacher, or leader originates the blessing of God in your life. Listen to me. There is only one ultimate authority, and that is who God is on the inside of you. And the leader, or the church system that suggests or implies that you cannot be rightly related to God without being rightly related to them is in error, and you should separate yourself from them as an unsafe influence in your life, no matter how orthodox they may seem to be. Let me say that again. Some churches, they say, if you leave this church, and the preachers will get up and say, I've heard it in the pulpit, it's a common story, many of us have heard this. Somebody left the church, family left the church, and the next Sunday they were going to another church, and they went across a railroad crossing, and they were hit by a train. They all died. They got out from under their covering. The idea of covering it is, as it is taught today is an absolute error. Now, we're not going to get into this now, but we will in the, when we study the book of Corinthians. But the point being, you need to listen to me, 
that the leader or church system that suggests or implies that you cannot be rightly related to God without being rightly related to them, that is an error and you should separate yourself from them as an unsafe influence no matter how orthodox they may seem. The leader that you are bound to is the leader that liberates you to launch into your destiny, not the leader that puts his hand upon you and keeps you back from fulfilling all that God has promised. Does that make sense to you? Verse 23, Jesus continues, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe. Ah, we're getting to the conversation about tithing. You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, in other words, from their spice gardens. But you have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. God's more interested about you making good judgments, walking in mercy, and exercising faith than he is about your tithe record. He said, these things ought you have done and not to have left the other undone. You blind guides that strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within you're full of extortion and excess. You blind Pharisee, cleanse that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside may be clean also. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? Jesus is pronouncing those that seem to outwardly have it all put together. He's saying a curse on you. A curse on you. Because you're binding up and keeping others from entering into the good things of God, but inwardly you are full of corruption and pollution. What a, what a powerful statement and one we need to stop and think about so we don't walk around condemned all the time. Because we're not living in sinless perfection and we're not glowing in the dark because we're so spiritual. Verse 27, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you're like whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inwardly are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, you outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of those that killed the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, generation of vipers. How will you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send to you prophets. Ah, New Testament dispensation. People say prophets aren't for today. They're repudiating the words of Jesus in Matthew 23, verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barachias, whom you slew between the porch and the altar. In other words, he's exposing a murder that nobody realizes had been done, and it was the father of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was assassinated secretly, and nobody exposed it, and Jesus, by word of knowledge, is making it known. What a scandal to these men. Verse 36, but verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent to you, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen that gathers her chicks under her wings and you would not. So what is the fate of a people that rejects modern day apostles and prophets? Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, Jesus says. For I say, you will not see me henceforth till you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So, in verse 23, Jesus speaks about the practice of tithing among the Pharisees. They were very meticulous in their tithing practice, but Jesus is saying that they have left off the weightier matters of judging right judgment, exercising mercy, and demonstrating faith. 
Do you understand? God's more concerned about you judging right judgment, showing mercy and demonstrating faith than he is about checking your tithe record. Should we tithe or should we not tithe? Do you realize that there are people that are tithing in sin because they're not tithing in faith? There are people that have never missed tithing every single 10% of every single resource they've ever had in their life. But they're tithing in sin because they're not doing it in faith. In Romans 14, 23, Paul said, Whatever is not of faith is sin. Even what you think is obedience is sin if it's not done in faith. If, however, you are more amenable to stop the practice of tithing because you, you think uh, it challenges your faith to give it that level, do you understand that to stop tithing is a sin? There are people who say, oh, I'm free from the tithe. Tithing's under the law. But in reality, what's happening is they don't have faith even to give 10%. And so some people are tithing without faith in that sin, and some people stop tithing, even if it was true that tithing is only under the law, but in stopping tithing, they're more motivated because they don't have faith to give at least 10%. Therefore, to stop tithing for them is a sin, even if, and I'm not saying one way or the other, even if the law was where tithing is found, and it's not found in the New Testament dispensation. And again, I'm not addressing that subject. What I am saying is doing whatever gets you into faith. There are people who don't tithe and claim to have this deeper understanding, when in reality it's just an expression of their unbelief, therefore they're in sin. And there are people that are tithing, but yet they're not doing it in faith, and therefore it's sin for them. Because again, Romans 14, 23, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So to stop tithing because of unbelief is sin, because of ceasing to tithe, you'd be expressing your unbelief. If you read, however, what am I getting at? I'm after you now. It's today, Friday. Can I take an offering? Uh, if you read in the New Testament, and you cannot justify tithing, and there's many people who do. They read the New Testament. They don't think tithing is incumbent upon them. Well, let me say this. In other words, you're a member of the Deeper Life Club. You honestly feel you have a deeper understanding and you don't feel obligation one bit to tithe. You believe you're free, you believe tithing was only under the law, and you're going to not allow somebody to bring you back into legalistic bondage by demanding that you tithe. Okay. Well, you, you, you are a deeper life brother. You're a deeper life sister. But what about Matthew 5.20 when Jesus said, Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise in, enter heaven. Therefore, if your understanding of the tithe is that it is only under the law and you are exempt, then you must accept the fact that your righteousness has to exceed a 10% giving standard or you're in unbelief and you're, in, and you're not tithing because of a belief that tithing is under the law. You're not tithing because of unbelief and that's sin. Are you listening to me? Because you're giving, if tithing is not for today, then your giving should exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees who meticulously tithe 10% of everything. The sad fact is, that many of those who consider themselves deeper life Christians in this doctrine of tithe from which they exempt themselves, they claim to have a higher revelation that they are free from the tithe as those that are free from the law. Their giving is not far in excess of what Jesus said. They should consider their liberty in Christ. See, 10% is the, is the beginning place of giving. Because if you honestly want to have a conversation about New Testament giving specifically the way Jesus taught, it's about give all, sell all, and come follow me. Are you ready to do that? Oh, yes. Well, it's amazing how many people are ready to do it but never get around to actually doing it. In verse 24, Jesus goes on to denounce those that are given to outward emphasis of legalized religion saying that Jesus says that they are blind guides who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. They focus on outward conformity, 
conformity, but inwardly they're full, verse 25, of extortion and excess. The focus should be, Jesus continues, verse 26, on inward piety that reflects outward spiritual purity, not the pretense of holiness that is only a thin veneer covering up a disgusting, hypocritical corruption within. The Pharisees and the scribes are deeply offended at this because they judge their forefathers as being sinful for killing the prophets, such as Isaiah, who was sawn asunder, Jeremiah, who was stoned to death in Egypt by Judean refugees. Yet in condemning those that came before them, they are affirming that they sprang from those very ungodly leaders. Now, my daddy didn't believe it like that, but I'm doing it different. Well, what's wrong with that? What's the point? The message is, you must be born again. You must come out. You must be willing to forsake your upbringing, your personal history, your cultural legacy, and be grafted into the culture of the kingdom, forsaking all else, that you might reflect the paternity of God and not the paternity of men. Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees were unwilling to relinquish their religious culture, They're condemned by Jesus as a generation of vipers. Serpents themselves left only to be destroyed, and that will in fact happen in just a few short years. In 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed and the city of Jerusalem was sacked by the Romans. Lastly, Jesus in verse 27, he laments over the city of Jerusalem because they have killed the prophets and they have slain those that were sent to them. His heart was that he would have often gathered them as a hen protects her chicks during a storm. What a perfect picture of the tender heart of God. What a perfect picture of the tender heart of God as a hen that gathers her chicks when the storm clouds are bearing down on the hen yard. But because... The Pharisees, the Sadducees refused. Then destruction is coming to the complete desolation of the city and Jewish culture itself, which will not turn or change. That destruction will not relent, Jesus says, until the day that the Jewish people say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now, what about our culture? You know, we could read that and say, yes, if I was in charge back then, I would not have cried, crucify him, crucify him. If it would have been up to me, I would not have allowed Jesus to be crucified. Well, what about Christianity? Listen, if first century Judaism lost out with God because they didn't know the day of their visitation, could that happen in our religious culture? Is Christianity so refined that we could not stumble in error? as that generation of Judaism that wound up calling for Jesus' death and brought destruction down upon themselves? Could Christianity go the way of first century Judaism? Is it possible that something else, just as Christianity was raised up to take Judaism's place, is it possible that something else could be raised up to take our place? Is Christianity too big to fail? Paul spoke most eloquently about this in Romans chapter 11, saying that the natural olive branch of Judaism was rejected. If that happened, then we should take heed lest Christianity as the wild olive branch grafted in, we might fall after the same example of unbelief. Father, we thank you for the gospel of Matthew. We thank you that there was someone named Matthew who came out of being a tax collector of all things and was ultimately used to bring down to us this narrative of the life of Jesus. Lord, I pray that these lessons would become life and breath to us, that we would look at ourselves with brutal honesty so that God, in the day that we live in, we can be found to be a part of the solution and not part of the problem. Amen.